Hello, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> I'm speaking to you from uh, before dawn in New Zealand, and I am absolutely delighted to be part of Rusty Days. I think it's fantastic that we've been able to take, um, or the, the um, Rust Warsaw team has been able to take what has been quite a negative uh, pandemic <laughs> and turn it into a global event, which is, which is perfect. I, uh, I should begin. So uh, just to reiterate, I'm sure this will come through on the stream. I'm more than happy to take questions via either any channel, via Twitch or YouTube, uh, or I think there's a, a third channel also. And uh, just ask questions online, and I will try to um, answer them as we go. The team is actually sitting behind me um, monitoring all of those streams. So that's great. OK. Where should we go? We'll start with. Uh, Start with moving something. Why is my screen not? There we are. Introduction. <laughs> Who am I? Uh, I tweet about Rust um, on Tim Clicks. I spend a whole bunch of time wasting time uh, about Rust on Reddit. I do live coding on Twitch. I make videos on YouTube. Um, I write books. So um, I've actually written this thing called Rust in Action. Uh, one of the reasons why I do that is that um, I've kind of taken it upon myself to shorten everyone's learning journey by 100 hours. Um, now, if you have just decided to come to this talk because you want to know how to apply unsafe to your own project, I've decided to just give you the answer. <laughs> we'll give you the answer straight away. So you don't have to watch a whole hour of talking. Uh, firstly, at the top of your crate, add an annotation, which is deny unsafe code. This will, uh, as we'll demonstrate in some other projects, this will uh, prevent the compiler from allowing you to uh, use unsafe unless you have been very, very explicit and told opted in. The other one is that before or within an unsafe block, you need to explain why it is that this code is safe. The compiler is no longer working for you, and so you need to do the work of the compiler for any future Rust programmer, including yourself, <laughs> who might come along and wonder why on earth is this safe? Um, and so one, one way which uh, I would recommend when you're doing the code review is to ask them, do you understand, can you explain to me why that is safe? Um, and if they cannot, then either the code needs to change or the comment needs to change. Our objective as Rust programmers, or <laughs> one of the objectives, let's say, or the objective right now is safety. Um, and let's all remember, while we're going through this process, that other people make mistakes, right? We, we, we never make mistakes, but other people do. <laughs> So how do we prevent their mistakes from infecting our code? We need to create a, a, a system of software engineering that makes it extremely hard for stressed, overworked, and uh, maybe uh, distracted individuals to do the wrong thing. We need to create the system as team leads, as, uh, as engineering managers, as junior developers. We need to participate uh, in a way that that gets the that learns our objection. So we want to learn about uh, how other projects are managing risk. But first, I just I would really in, like to take the time uh, to talk about lemons and limes. Now, if you speak English as a second language, this may sound very strange, um, but uh, this is the story about how the British Navy, or Britain in particular. Uh, understood in the 18th century how to cure scurvy. And by the 20th century, they had completely forgot it. In fact, the scientific advice at the start of the 20th century was so bad that it caused scurvy in the Antarctic and expeditions quite famously um, and led to some um, uh, horrendous tragedy. And so there were many reasons why this occurred. And one of the main reasons, though, is that the Eng well. A contributing factor was that the English word lime included lemons also at the time in which the scientific and, and 
at the time at which the cure was found, which was use just drink lemon juice, uh, you know, sprinkle some lemon <laughs> into water and just drink that. Um, and so I want to reiterate that if your code comments cannot be understood by your audience, that is, then they need to change. And it isn't the, the surface, it isn't the words themselves that are important. It's the meaning behind that. People who are reading your code need to understand why it is that uh, the code that you have written is safe. You need to do the work of the compiler for it. Just a warning. <laughs> Just allowing unsafe is actually insufficient to guarantee safety. Unfortunately, Rust still has some problems. Well, no, it doesn't have problems. It just has something to um, be aware of. Um, it is actually possible to generate code that is guaranteed to crash your program using only, uh, only safe code. <clears throat> now, this is a ridiculous code example. No one is ever going to wrap a vector of type T uh, with another container, uh, but maybe you're doing something stupid. <laughs> I say stupid. Um, maybe you're doing something uh, and you don't realize that you've created the situation where two of your primitive types, maybe inside a struct, actually are an invariant on the other one. So that is the position, this position variable here relies on the fact, like there's an intimate relationship between storage and position that uh, the compiler cannot guarantee. And so by mistake, let's, in this case it's intentional, but potentially, let's say by mistake, I've written some code that, uh, breaks the, the, the link between two of the primitive types. In this case, uh, I can set position to something that is unreachable. And then when the next call, like if someone calls get, this will break uh, and it will crash the entire program. Now, obviously I could have, there are, there are ways to, to get around this. I could have replaced um, uh, this index notation with the get method and that would return an option. Um, but this is completely safe code, and it is 100% guaranteed crash. Um, so <laughs> uh, just before we get to the projects, I also thought I should explain a little bit around my methodology, if there, if there was any methodology. Um, I firstly wanted to talk a little bit about the rationale about why I did this. I was really disappointed with the Rust community's response to the ethics web um, unsafe like basically driving, if you've been around the Rust community a little bit, you'll be familiar with this. But if you're very new, um, one very famous example of unsafe or the use of unsafe code or uh, was this project called Actix Web where the developer happily used unsafe blocks. <clears throat> uh, and then when people said, look, you can't do this, it's, you know, there's no, there's no requirement. Um, Eventually, that person was driven out of the of the Rust community um, now because of this kind of cultural difference, and um, and that made me think like, well, how like well, what what is the right way to do this? If that is the wrong way, <laughs> I think I think it was unfair to drive that person away, um, and uh, the two main aims I think are to understand what it is that professional companies, people that are paid lots of money to write very good software and doing very hard things with Rust, like what do they do? And I would also like to, I just wanted to do some research to justify doing more research. Actually, I've got several ideas about how to extend this. Uh, so what did I do? Um, sorry, just to pause slightly, I'm doing qualitative research, not quantitative. What that means is I'm, I'm not looking for, a, a, I haven't hacked the compiler to be able to do an analysis. Uh, and this is quite, um, is, I've used a lot of interpretation here. So it's, 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 it's not an analysis of every Rust crate. It's kind of looking very closely at 10. Um, and they were basically a sample of products or projects that I thought were interesting. Um, I tried to create a sample of open source um, from the GNOME project all the way through to uh, like Amazon and Microsoft, these big, big companies um, as well. And I was looking primarily at their documentation for new contributors 
And then I would go in to look at their code snippets uh, via like uh, searching for unsafe inside their repository. Now, I intentionally did not communicate with any of these projects um, <laughs> because I'd, um, that I was doing this. So none of these projects are aware that actually they have been part of this, um, this project. So let's, let's have a look. Uh, server. <clears throat> server is Rust's foundational project. It was kind of the reason why it was created, to create a parallel web browser. Uh, it's fascinating looking through the GitHub because a lot of the documentation around how to write code is written in about 2013. So it's quite old from Rust's point of view. Um, one thing I found fascinating is that they include this annotation of their crates, which is, oh, sorry, the annotation that he uses, deny. Uh, but at the end, at the start of any um, function that uses unsafe within it, they, uh, or any module that requires unsafe, they are required to allow it and opt in. So this, I think, is a really nice strategy for increasing the psychological barrier to including unsafe. Now, just to provide a, a very, this is a, again another convoluted example, but this is a demonstration of what happens inside Servo. So you can imagine that they have modules, and the module itself has this annotation that we deny unsafe. Uh, the deny attribute al allows programmers to later on annotate internal things with allow. So you can basically, you're opting out of unsafe here. But you can opt back in if you really need it. The reason why I think this is quite a, an interesting strategy is that I just feel like it's harder to and it, <laughs> it's harder to do mentally, and it would there's no way it would pass code review. I think unsafe would it's unlikely to pass code review, but this ugly annotation syntax there's no way that would get through. Um, um, I was also curious as to what Cargo Geiger does internally as well. So Cargo Geiger is a cargo extension which actually inspects your own code and all of the code of your dependencies for usages of unsafe. Um, <laughs> but how do they do it themselves? Like this, for me, um, was really, really interesting. They've gone further than deny unsafe. They've actually said forbid. Now, the forbid keyword or the forbid attribute does not allow you to annotate internal methods as allow unsafe. So it just tells the entire the compiler that it's completely illegal. Uh, <clears throat> future programmers in the project will only be able to include unsafe blocks if <laughs> somehow the project decides to uh, like remove this annotation from the, the root of their crate. Uh, so effectively, the way this looks in code is uh, we've, we've, we add forbid, and then it's impossible to, like, the only way to compile this dangerous function is by commenting it out. Like, there, we, cannot, we cannot opt in to allow. It will not, the compiler will refuse to compile the code. Uh, again, kind of looking into some of um, Rust's uh, ecosystem, well, some of the long-standing utilities, I wanted to kind of get a sense as to whether or not um, the, the, the cultural, I wonder, I wanted to know if the unsafe usage had changed. So Ixa is a replacement for the ls command, which is a Unix utility. And it, it's one of Rust, the Rust community's oldest uh, command line utilities that is in public use. So um, XA talks to a file system, and it does that via system calls. Uh, it doesn't need many. It's, it, uses, it does not use much unsafe at all. But for extended attributes inside, uh, it requires this um, the list extra attribute uh, sql family on Linux and Mac OS. So the strategy that they have developed is to employ to only wrap the minimum of what they need. So basically, every single function that they wish to call, now I'll explain the syntax very quickly um, in just a moment. But effectively, this is the Rust code. 
and all they are doing is wrapping the C, like wrapping the C function. Uh, and so the strategy there is to put unsafe around the smallest element possible. And the idea is, I assume, to make it very, very understandable about what is the purpose of unsafe. And in this case, we are, uh, the reason why we need unsafe is because the Rust compiler cannot reason about what happens inside the operating system. And so it just requires you. <laughs> it, we just need to expect that the operating system is going to be well behaved. Now, going back to the uh, to that comment around, we need to understand why this is safe. Um, if you haven't used pointer syntax, this is probably confusing. Uh, I want to. Um, so first of all, we have a whole bunch of types that are not really used in traditional Rust code. But if you're using libc, if you're using any FFI, you've probably seen that before. Um, and if you've programmed in C, um, this probably makes some sense. Uh, we take a path, so we the the uh, a pointer to effectively in in Rust syntax, this would be a vec of u8. We've got a, a reference to c string. A C string is like a vec of U8 with a null uh, byte at the end. And then we're creating a null pointer, which in a convention of C programmers is to spend a null pointer, kind of how a Rust programmer would use um, an option, uh, zero. I'm not sure what that does. So that is, I think, size. <coughs> and uh, and we have a an integer being used as flags. and the way that that works is that in C, uh, a convention is that each bit represents an on-off switch. And, um, and so that's what that's going to be used. So bear in mind, it's important to think about whether or not your team is familiar with this kind of code. If it is, maybe it doesn't need comments. But if, it is, like if you have team members or you might have new team members that are less familiar with this type of syntax, be verbose. Oh, so that this is where it came from. Um, another example that uh, I think is quite interesting is Blake 3. So Blake 3 is this new cryptographic hash function that's supposed to be um, really, really fast and also very good. Oh, I think I've just received a, oh, no, I haven't received a comment. Oh, by the way, <laughs> if you're watching this live, do ask questions. Uh, more than happy to receive them as we're going through. You have stopped using MD5. Just, 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 just asking that question, right? <laughs> it's no longer, um, it's no longer best practice. So, why is unsafe needed in this project? Well, Blank Three wants to make use of very high performance uh, functionality within the CPU, and that requires intrinsics uh, access to intrinsics. Uh, we have vector instructions that can operate on more than one um, element at a time. So they have used the minimal wrapper strategy as well. <laughs> now, uh, this is a kind of a like a like a vector. Well, actually, it's closer to an array um, that has a width of two hundred fifty six bits of integers, and we call this kind of crazy thing in the middle. This is what the unsafe. Um, this is the function that's provided by. Um, and if you have used, making no sense. <laughs> this is the function that is provided by the compiler when you opt into intrinsics. Your uh, and from the Rust code, uh, we only see add. A lot of the complexity is hidden from us, and I think this is a really, a really interesting strategy. Now. One thing that the authors of the crate have decided to spend extra attention on is that when we use pointers in unsafe blocks, that's especially dangerous. And we need to be especially careful. And so um, they've made extra effort to annotate those sections with code comments. Now. 
uh, I get into a project from Amazon. And this is the foundation for the AWS Lambda and the AWS Fargate projects. And um, it's a, so this, first we'll start with the question, like, why do they need unsafe? Well, they're interacting with a hypervisor. <laughs> they're basically building an operating system manager. Um, and they also use a lot of Chrome OS inside their own project. And so they've actually got a lot of code generation. Um, and so their strategy, <laughs> and I, I don't mean to blame them. It was just, I thought, I mean, you know, they've just got, like, it's co automatic code that includes unsafe. And so there's just this comment there saying, this is automatically generated. And so that's their strategy <laughs> for, for, a lot of, for a lot of their uses. Um, just as a comment saying, um, I don't know why <laughs> this is safe. So, um, oh, the um, I wanted to call out the contributing markdown file. Sorry, it hasn't rendered very nicely on the screen. Um, the point I want to make here is that they have a big document which explains why you should or how to contribute, but it doesn't address unsafe at all. Uh, it talks about code comments and um, and and so forth and pull requests and unit tests, and, and that's all great. But this is an operating system project, and they don't mention unsafe in any of their guidelines. Um, Windows, oh, sorry, Microsoft is developing a, a language prediction, um, otherwise known as a Rust interface, for the Windows runtime, which I think is ridiculously exciting. Like, it's amazing to see that Rust's uh, usage across operating systems is first class, so thanks to Microsoft. Um, obviously, they speak to Windows APIs, whether or not that is um, like kernel 32, DLL, or whichever interface that they use. Um, they need to trust the operating system, and so they have to use unsafe. So their strategy, again, are these minimal wrappers um, done slightly differently. So previous, so this is a bit of a confusing method to see. Um, what we're dealing with here is an array of type T, which happens to be generated by the Windows runtime. So it, um, it allows you to create. So what we're trying to do in this impl block is create methods that allow you to create uh, objects that the Windows runtime understands. Now. Um, the, uh, there are several other methods as well, but I want to call out with len because I thought it was, this is where we have unsafe. And so um, the uh, so this is a create we're creating a new object here. So this is kind of like the width capacity, only it's uh, of vec width capacity. But here we're creating an array with with a length of guaranteed to be let's say ten twenty four or something. Um, we want to make sure, first there's this assertion, which is um, good practice. And then um, we're saying that this is this code task mem alloc is the call that we need to use, which is fine. Um, but I am personally, I mean, if you are a Windows, like a Microsoft programmer, you probably understand what this means like innately. But it feels like to me, as someone who's looking at the code fresh, that this unsafe block is doing quite a lot of work um, inside it. And so what we're doing is we are calling this uh, part of the Windows API. Um, and we've got our length. So that's the number of elements in our array. And then we multiply that by the size of memory of, of our type. And so you know you can kind of see where that's one function. And then this returns something, and then we coerce it to a pointer to T. So maybe if you are familiar with systems programming, this comes very naturally to you. But um, I think that if something were to happen inside of one of my projects, I would have expected that I would have provided some explanation about what is happening. But again, maybe if you are developing systems um, programming, like if you're developing operating systems, this stuff is so natural that you don't need to. I'm not sure. Um, I do note as well that they provide annotations as to describe why it is that uh, the um, operation is safe. And so we're actually writing to the pointer 
um, to um, starting at zero, I assume. So this is a point data is a, is a pointer. So we just created that there. We, I assume it's, we start at zero and we write length. I'm wondering, and I don't know enough about, um, about this, but I assume the difference, interestingly, we've got length multiplied by system, I mean, like this, the, but here we're only using length. And I, I wonder whether or not that's a bug. I'm not sure. Um, I'd be interested to hear from anyone. Um, can I enlarge the code? Yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> Hi, read me Markdown. So what I really like is um, uh, the Windows, um, the Windows, sorry, the Microsoft team believes that they want to create this runtime with 100% pure safe Rust. But they make this um, call out that sometimes that they have to go and talk to their um, to the to the APIs, and they are implemented in C++. And they make safety as like a first class citizen in their readme, which I think is a really positive sign. Now, uh, a project from the GNOME project, <laughs> sub -pro a project within GNOME, um, is their, uh, they're rewriting lib, uh, I think lib, um, a C library in Rust. So this is uh, a CSV renderer. And the question becomes, why do they need unsafe? Well, this crate, uh, lib rust rsvg, SVG <laughs> talks to glib. Glib is a kind of a core of, um, of GNOME in some sense. And it is like another C library. So again, you can see this pattern of requiring, we're building out new functionality in Rust, and we need to rely on older implementations, um, or not older, but pre-existing code that is written in unsafe languages. Uh, and also Rust itself, sorry, the Rust code itself exposes the same C API as the library that preceded it. Um, one thing that I think is really positive in this project is that the entire culture is focused on questioning whether or not unsafe is uh, a valid thing to do. Now, this is a code comment um, from uh, one of their code reviews inside a merge request, which is GitLab's um, version of pull requests. And you know, uh, the project lead there makes this um, really good point, which is, why are you using an unsafe construct? Because I think that we could use a safer option instead. Now, I found this inside their code after like looking through their commits. and. Um, I think it's really positive to see that people have got in their heads this idea that if we, when we can avoid unsafe, we should do so. Because the compiler is, the compiler does not get tired. The compiler does not get distracted. And the compiler um, can have bugs. I'm sure that there are compiler bugs. Um, but Rust, uh, safe Rust is, is good Rust. Uh, we've seen the minimal wrapper strategy before, so I'll just pass on that one. I also wanted to look at um, the Rust standard library. They have provided explicit advice for code reviews. They require comments around each use of unsafe, and they have some tooling a lint in their continuous integration builds that checks that there is a comment. Obviously, the lint probably can't read <laughs> code comments to check that they relate to the code block, but at least they're there. Uh, and there are humans checking these things as well. So I like this other, the last sentence there. Unsafe code actually needs to be OK. Like, it, don't put unsafe un code in there that is actually unsafe. Like, that is not a good thing to put inside the standard library. Um, <clears throat> another thing that they call out inside their, um, their guidelines is that it's OK to ask for help. So if you, so we we mention we see a mention here of uh, the unsafe code guidelines working group, and I'll mention uh, what they uh, what that is very very soon properly. Uh, but there are experts with inside the Rust language that know a lot about 
Rust. And so if you are unsure, it's okay to ask them for help. In fact, they even made this point that everyone loves <laughs> debating whether or not there is an unsound problem here, like whether or not. So, you know, don't be worried. You know, you're actually making someone's day by <laughs> by being able to get some, some reasoning here and some expertise. Uh, now, if you are a tiny project, this obviously does not apply as equally to you. So, you know, we don't have a large team of, of uh, collaborators and colleagues to call upon. And so um, my advice there would be to be cautious and to kind of build yourself up into things that you know rather than um, things that you don't. And don't try to use constructs that you don't understand, is, is, um, is what I'm saying there. Um, one thing I think is really, really, um, really good is that um, the public documentation explains why things may panic. And if you read the code comments of standard pointer read, you'll see that there is uh, invariants that are described, which is that the source of where you're reading from must be valid for reads. And so, and by the way, you must initialize that value before you actually try and read from a pointer. And so without those, um, the, the, the method is unsafe. And so even if size t has size zero, the point, pointer must be non-null, which is interesting. But, um, <clears throat> so I think that including, if you have an unsafe method or unsafe function, including a safety section is a very sound strategy. Uh, a further project which is less less um, well known is um, this thing called Toolshed. Toolshed is a, a memory allocator. It uses an arena strategy or provides an arena for you, which is basically to the operating system, it looks like you've just asked for a large chunk of memory. Uh, and inside your program, you can divide that up internally however you want. Um, it's typically faster, but um, can be slightly less efficient. You might get some wasted space. Um, now, why do they need unsafe? <laughs> well, if you're dealing with memory blocks, you probably need to deal with pointers. And that means that you uh, need unsafe. And so their strategy has been to push every usage of unsafe into one specific module, which happens to be arena.rs. Even though the API is completely safe, uh, all of the unsafety is is uh, isolated with inside one module. And so people know if they're touching that module, like it's dangerous. And uh, again, like we're trying to create a situation where as a team, we are building safe software and mentally we're switched on when we go and interact with that module. So again, here is a uh, another project which is um, far less well known, which I think is really interesting is a new database that, or a new graph database actually, being developed out of Ireland. And inside it, it's the storage engine is written in Rust, but the reasoning engine is written in Prolog. Now they need unsafe because they're interfacing with this Prolog Im implementation. And now how have they done that? They have gone further than isolating at the module boundary in some sense. They have actually created a third crate. So they have, uh, which provides the uh, sort of a wrapper and interface as a, a, a completely outside of their project <laughs> or their core storage project. So the storage engine, the written in Rust that deals with keeping data and persisting it to disk has no, um, uh, has no knowledge of the, the prolog implementation. Uh, it's completely independent and so, if there was a problem with inside uh, that uh, kind of wrapper crate, um, it wouldn't infect the, the, the storage engine. Uh, they also have a very strong strategy, like a very strong uh, code commenting practice with inside the team. And so um, almost, 
you know, seen on the slide, it's a bit difficult. So <clears throat> allow me to explain what's happening here. So um, inside, so inside their code, <clears throat> when they store data to disk or um, unsigned integers to disk, they compress it using a variable length encoding scheme. Uh, there's a public method in CodeVec that um, allocates memory. So we create a vector of size, <clears throat> of size length, and uh, and this, and then we call an internal method really, which is encode unchecked. Even at this wrapper, um, um, like even at the this isn't really unsafe. We're just calling an unsafe function or an unsafe method. There's already a safety block saying, we know that we have created our VIC with the required length, and so therefore it is safe. And inside the that, uh, that unchecked method, the encode unchecked, there's even more commenting. So this is the internal method. Basically, everything that happens inside this method is well indexed. <laughs> Possibly, you know, we don't necessarily need to say that about incrementing. Um, but what I think that this project gets right is that they want to assume that people are looking at this code with very, very blurry, tired eyes. And uh, they're even specifying why we're using an, an integer, sorry, an, an, an index um, integer, which I think I've never seen before. And uh, this makes it very, very difficult to not be, a, it makes it very difficult, it makes it very easy to understand what the code is doing and very hard to, to get it wrong, in my opinion. Okay. We're coming up to one of the final projects that I want to touch on. And uh, this is Fuchsia from Google. So the Fuchsia kernel is actually written, uh, it's not written in Rust. Rust is, using, is used in kind of systems components. Um, but the kernel, I believe, is written in C++, but might be um, pure C. Their team. They have got code documentation that uh, makes it very clear that if you're writing adding unsafe to the code, you need to uh, you need to ensure that it's safe. It's your responsibility, and it's essential that you identify any assumptions that are required by every unsafe block. You need to ensure that those assumptions are actually met, not just that you've identified them, but actually, that in this case, that they've been met. And over time, it's possible for those assumptions to continue to be met. Now, this is a really interesting, a uh, really interesting bullet point to add because it means that the programmer today is responsible for thinking about how people might use this in the future. Um, and this becomes even more explicit uh, soon. Um, so further, oh, right, sorry, I just added the twice. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> um, I just, uh, I, yeah, we'll carry on. So one of the things that is um, very clear by now is that Projects that do this well, use unsafe properly, I said properly, uh, add comments to the unsafe blocks to explain why it is safe. And, uh, and if you're inside the future project, you also require a comment explaining you know, what assumptions are being made. Like Previously, we saw that we made an assumption that the length being provided to a, a, a pointer read or pointer write was of sufficient length. And so, um, that seems relatively clear. But um, this documentation is actually available in public for every contributor to the project. Um, oh. 
Sorry about the rendering of this um, slide. <laughs> Where possible. So this is a very good explanation for the minimal wrappers strategy. So where possible, it package any unsafety into a single functional module. And then document what it is that needs to be the case before it becomes safe, how things fail, and uh, how things, uh, what happens if everything succeeds. Now this, um, seems like a very, very sound strategy to me. Um, the Google, this, the Future OS project um, has the most robust guidelines, in my opinion, for writing unsafe blocks of code safely. Partially for this reason. Uh, I, again, I apologize for how this is rendered on the screen. So. Um, there's a couple of sections here. So there are three particular types that the documentation calls out as being particularly dangerous. Star const, star mut, or unsafe cell. So these are pointer types. They are, they are, does, they are um, specifically called out as things that need to be very heavily documented. And the uh, comment down the bottom is talking about memory aliasing and that um, you can either, in, in Rust, you can, you can either alias. So that means you can have two shared re two references. Uh, it's got a read-only references. So this is the ampersand syntax. You can have multiple of those. You can have multiple readers. But you can only have a single writer. And um, you need to explain that if you have been able to, if you've used one of these unsafe types, that you have uphold that guarantee that is provided by the Rust compiler. Uh, <laughs> obviously. So um, now these resources, you can't click on the links, <laughs> sadly. But you can definitely look them up. And I will um, ensure that links are provided um, for anyone that would like them. and. Uh, um, just thinking about the way <laughs> to, to get them there. Um, but i uh, like to call out the Fuchsia OS team, Brian Anderson. Uh, Ralph Young has provided two fantastic articles, in particular was the person who created um, that example of having two types that are both safe and of themselves, but when they relate to each other and you break that connection, you can create unsafety inside Safe Rust. Um, there's a really nice um, guide of um, Rust patterns within inside the Rust unofficial repository um, that talks about un uh, condensing or containing or isolating unsafety within small modules. Or um, And lastly, the unsafe working groups, um, unsafe code guidelines reference, um, which I want to, oh, which I would like to see if I can bring up now. Um, so, uh, where are we? So inside the Rustlang um, org is a uh, unsafe code guidelines repository, and you may notice this. Um, <clears throat> this author, Ralph Young, is the same person who wrote those two fantastic articles about unsafety in Rust. Now. Uh, this is a very good description of the things that you need to be aware of if you are writing unsafe code and to, you want to be able to, it, it isn't quite as mature as I expected it to be, um, but I think it is developing. And if this is an area that you are interested in, I believe that you should continue to, um, I think you should participate. Uh, so it's the main output of the group is a is a reference document, and I'm sure that this I'm sure that there are many patches welcome <laughs> from anyone inside the community. And so uh, that is uh, I think that is the talk actually. We'll um, I'm more than happy to. Uh, 
um, answer any questions that people have, um, but just a, a moment again to say thank you very much for the organizers of the conference. I am uh, very privileged to be part of it, uh, even from the other side of the world. And so I am more than happy to stay online and uh, again, answer any questions that come through. I'll try to get a, um, I'll get a link, Try. I'll try to post um, that in the YouTube uh, comments to where I have the slides and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, ask away, ask away in any of the, in any of the channels that you're, um, they are, if you, <laughs> if you're watching the stream, ask the, in the comments and, um, and those comments are being, are being monitored. I'm just sending the organizers a link and uh, of the slides that I have, as well as the research that I've done on all the projects, because there's a little bit of, of more material there that you might be interested in. So we've received our first question, which I think is a really fascinating one. And it's from YouTube. And I believe it's, uh, um, I'm going to get, my English pronunciation is going to be terrible of this name. Um, Signabu Sikaris, what would be your advice to new Rust programmers who are too happy to use Unsafe? <sighs> so if I re if I re so the, the question there is you have someone who is new to Rust, maybe they have a lot of experience or they've just graduated from university and they look at Unsafe and they say, oh. Using unsafe just means I can apply the same idioms that I am used to in C++ <laughs> or in some other language. And uh, my advice would be that the reason is, is to ask them to step back and say, well, why are you learning Rust? Um, you know, you can write, you can use pointers manually in other languages. And in fact, in a way that is much more ergonomic Rust makes it very fussy. Uh, it's 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 not nice to use unsafe like use pointers in Rust. Like I think it's done intentionally. It's intentionally clumsy in some sense. And if you have come to Rust because you want to write in a safe programming language without a garbage collector, then uh, use the compiler to your advantage. Um, so. Uh, there is a, a second question from um, from YouTube. Again, I apologize for my um, <laughs> for my my English pronunciation, especially the stress on the wrong part of the word. But um, Michel uh, Lazowski, great lecture, thank you. Which strategy is the best in your opinion? <laughs> yeah, uh, I am not an expert in this. I would defer to. Uh, the unsafe working group. But <laughs> if you were going to ask me um, for my advice, it would be to add a comment to each use of unsafe. And that will force you to mentally check. It will just slow you down and cause you to pause to double check that what you are doing is sensible. That would be my one takeaway uh, from Twitch. Um, Hashidong, you've covered calling unsafe code inside functions, but what about creating functions which are themselves safe? Do I have any thoughts on that? Uh, I do. And that is, we, uh, I don't, I could try and potentially try and scroll all the way through. Uh, so where was I? I was over here. Oh. Um, so I think it was Xer has created a function, like a Rust function around a C function. Oh, actually, it's a safe function around an unsafe function. Um, actually, that wasn't quite what I want to do. I believe, oh, no, that's not right either. Um, <laughs> so my strategy for this is to write minimal wrappers around uh, around and create 
functions that are very, very easy to understand. Okay, another question from Twitch. Doc Chris, please. Thanks for the talk. You mentioned some lints that we can use to assist developers in maintaining code while unsafe. Are there any changes to the language or any unexisting lints that you would like to see introduced to make this easier and more, li more reliable? Hmm. I would say to that, use Clippy, right? So, uh, <laughs> so um, Let's see if we can find it. Rust clipping. Not in that repository. Come on, GitHub. Let's let's do this properly. Okay, there we go. There's Rust Clippy. Now, Rust Clippy is a community repository of good practices. Hundreds and hundreds of these things. <laughs> and I love this code that is just raw. Do not use this in your own thing. Uh, so now you I wouldn't I don't I, I, I expect that the lint that this code comment linting that is applied by, I think it was the uh, one of the projects anyway, <laughs> I think it was the standard library. I'm, I assume that they have upstreamed uh, the lint into Clippy. This is where I would go. And if they haven't, well, you know, there's a job for this weekend. <laughs> now, oh, this is great. Again, from Twitch, um, M-R-O-W-Q-A, why do you laugh so much? I love it. <laughs> I laugh because I'm nervous, partially. Um, I, I, I laugh because uh, I try to remember that programming is primarily creative endeavor. And uh, it's OK to learn. It's OK to make mistakes. It's OK to um it's okay to grow and that means that we need to do the we, we need we, we need to learn in a way that is supportive and so there's no sense and i i i don't want to start telling people or dictate exactly how people should code in there and i don't want people to feel as if they are inadequate in any way one of the things, that, one of the reasons that I program in Rust or, and learned and took the time to learn Rust, and one of the reasons why I teach Rust is that it empowers everyone to write strong, safe software. Even me, like I am an, I am a mediocre programmer in many senses. Uh, yes, I've, and you know, I, de I developed in Python for a long, long time and uh, probably over a decade and spent a long time in data science. Everyone, every every piece of documentation that I wrote, uh, that I read around writing C extensions to make Python go faster, was the first paragraph almost said, "Only experts should do this," or you know, "This is dangerous," you know, or what well, some some sort of language like that. And I was always intimidated. Rust was the very that was the first systems programming language community that made me feel welcome. And I want other people to feel welcome as well. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter whether or not you're from the San Francisco, you know, from the Bay Area, or whether you are from South Asia. You should feel like a participant, and 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 you are you have a place at this table. And I want everyone to feel welcome. Okay, a question from YouTube from Andrew Bogus: If my unsafe code is unsound but works. For example, it might be faster. Should I change it for uh, a slower, but something that is guaranteed, a slower version that is guaranteed to be sound? We have an example of this in the standard library, or not, not so much. So it probably is the case that if you have something that is fast but dangerous, that it is, it works for known good cases. Like if you set everything up correctly, it will go fine. But if things are set up badly, it, they might blow up and explode on you. <laughs> I do not recommend anything that is like that takes user input or anything you're going to install on someone else's computer. I do not recommend that you expose them to security vulnerabilities caused by buffer overruns. But 
If you're the kind of person that likes to play dangerous, um, here's my advice for you. Create two methods. The first one, and the one that you should use primarily, is safe code. It is pure Rust. That is uh, pure safe Rust. Secondly, have another method that has the same signature, but has underscore unchecked or underscore unsafe. And describe why it is that when you call this, that, like what are what you've done to ensure that it's safe when you call it. If you know that certain edge cases will cause it to explode, call the safe method. Like if you might be in a situation where they might occur, but if you know, if you have initialized, or if you're doing scientific community, scientific computing, for example, you know all of your data uh, pretty intimately. You know exactly how it's laid out in memory and so forth. You can probably guarantee that the edge cases will never occur. I'm not smart enough for that, so I <laughs> I would urge you to <laughs> I would urge you to stick with safe. But if you want to, you know, like I, I, yeah, then that that's over to you. Uh, okay. Uh, another question from YouTube. Zoran uh, Lazarevkic, have you ever had situations where your unsafe code has broken, broke the safety in Rust? And can and if so, can you give an example of how that has manifest? No, I have not. I haven't broken the Rust compiler. I know that some other people have. Um, for example, I believe there was a regression in uh, one four five relating to. Uh, uh, the use of um, there was uh, a, a strange edge case relating to propagation of constants, like and uh, like toy code with references. And um, uh, I haven't experienced that myself. Okay, so um, YouTube, Michel uh, Lozowski, is it possible to have in your project too many comments? That slide with Terminus DB had quite a lot, in my opinion. I agree. I mean, it's very, very difficult to know where the balance is. Perhaps the balance exists. It depends on the maturity of the project. I can imagine that if you know that there are very competent developers and people who are very familiar with the domain, that you don't need many comments. But if unsafe is a warning to you, like if it, there are some people they see unsafe, they're like, "Wow, <laughs> hey, like this is this is my play area. Like the, I love this stuff. Um, I, I love pointers. I love it's a, it's, a, it's all fine to me." Then um, maybe they don't need comments. But if you're the kind of project that uses unsafe in less than one percent of their code base, like probably uh, most projects. And whenever someone sees unsafe, they kind of tense up slightly because they're worried that they're going to crash their own system or potentially introduce security vulnerabilities for their users. Add more comments. I don't know if every single line needs to be commented. I thought it was interesting to find a, a code in production. At least it provides more robustness. Um, uh, Oh, OK. From Twitch, Solus Ruffle. Is that like somehow reflective back on me? The username is Solus Ruffle. I really enjoyed your talk, thanks. But I have one question. What would be some good starting points for developers who are new to lower level programming language who want to learn how to safely write unsafe Rust? Do you know of any resources that teach these skills from a Rust perspective? Solus Waffle, do I have a book for you? <laughs> uh, I will. I, I feel very. Uh, I I don't do this because it's an ad. I apologize uh, if you know, this offends anybody. Um, but I do think that my book is designed to ex do that exactly, and so I think it's appropriate here. The uh, Rust in Action book teaches you both Rust and systems programming uh, at the same time. <laughs> it does that. It will introduce you to unsafe. It doesn't go through all of those explanations, but it does make you familiar with um, with uh, some of the reasons why you might use unsafe. And so um, 
hopefully hopefully that's too not too much of an ad but but um i would recommend uh in taking a look and checking the reviews and checking whether or not this seems like something that might be sensible for you uh youtube from andrew bogus by the way ask me if you want a lint and clippy i think i want a lint and clippy i think the community would love more robustness around unsafe code and so uh i spent a little bit of time in fact probably too much time should have been preparing for the talk um inspecting clippy and i originally well I originally wanted to run linters over every public crate in Crates.io and maybe some, uh, and try and find out whether or not, uh, I wanted to go and inspect the uses of unsafe to see like, what are people doing? Are they manipulating pointers? Are they doing um, some weird things like transmutation, like in interpreting the bit patterns of, uh, of like various, you know, like an uh, an array as as integers and so forth, um, but um, but no. Oh, we've actually got quite a few. Oh, two more comments. I would, um, and so so yeah. Sorry to answer that question. Yes, add the lint. <laughs> I'm sure that logic, um, the the maintainer of that project will be happy to to accept it. Um, uh, Twitch, Lewis code. Does Rust have a way of marking unsafe code and working smoothly with it like un Haskell's IO monad? Maybe an unsafe trait marker. That is the unsafe trait. Sorry, that's the unsafe keyword itself, I would say. Um, you're not going, I, there are people who probably are type theorists and who understand Rust's type system very uh, innately. And I, but I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to admit some ignorance there. I think that there are, you could possibly have marker traits. You could definitely create something was like, you know, um, you could create a marker trait, which implies unsafe, I believe. Uh, yes, and I, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. I'm, I've never done it, but I think that there are unsafe traits. Uh, and so as soon as you implement that, you mark your own type as unsafe, but I, um, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to express a little bit of ignorance there, and just and just allow the uh, the type theorists in the back channel uh, ask ask on Reddit, ask on uh, users.rustlang.org, and uh, and find out because again, participating in the Rust community is exactly why uh, Rust is great. You know, <laughs> this, these technical these technical reasons are fine and perfect. Um, you can see that other language communities are adopting a lot of the, uh, you know, D is investigating very, uh, is investigating lifetimes and, um, and C++ have lots of, um, have changed their practices to be able to use um, smart pointers rather than raw pointers, for example. And so the technical parts of the Rust community, I think, will be adopted by other languages. What we have that's special is the participation in the community aspect. And so if there's something that's unfamiliar to you, I would strongly encourage you to ask. We um, <laughs> Now, Michael Ward on YouTube asks uh, a question. Why do you feel like bad about promoting my book? Uh, I'm eight chapters in, and it's great. OK. <sighs> I feel bad about promoting my book because people have to pay money for my book. Um, I uh, I've been working in open. I mean, I've been contributing open source code for like fifteen years, or something like this. And I just find it very difficult to ask for money from people. Um, and I think, especially from people who are learning and who don't know what is good and what is not. I don't like. Uh, you know, about 90% of people that read my book think it's excellent. No, about 80% think it's excellent. About 10%, 10 to 15% think it's very good. And about 5% five, <laughs> 5 want to throw it in the burn and like throw it in the fire. <laughs> so uh, now I don't want to recommend that you should buy it if you're going to throw it in the fire. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't... Um, uh, 
I don't know. I, it's just a personal thing. I, I, I should get better at asking for money. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give like an extra 10 to 15 seconds uh, for me to make a decision on the most interesting question. The most interesting question actually receives a, uh, I think we, I think Manning, my publisher, has provided some codes to the organizers. Um, if you are selected, so if you think of anything, ask a question, like ask a question, I'll try and include it. Um, but I'll try and pick a winner. If you are the winner, please stay on whichever channel you have uh, asked your question on, such that the organizers can contact you to send you the code. <laughs> Uh, if you are interested, like you're talking about, if you are interested in buying the book, if you go to rustinaction.com, there's a 40% discount code um, on that page. Now, I actually really liked the first question. What would be my advice to Rust programmers who are too happy to use unsafe? I think that this is very interesting from like a psychological point of view because it talks to the culture of people that are new to Rust and try and, you know, there's a lot to this idea that bringing people to a new, like, like it, we, there's a, there are multiple mental shifts that happen when you learn the Rust programming language. And uh, one of them is this idea that you need to trust the compiler. You know, the compiler is not your enemy. Your compiler is actually your ally. Uh, you, you, the, compi the Rust compiler actually is, is on your team. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I find that, you know, it's not, um, so I, I definitely think that that one, um, that for me is the most interesting or kind of the most compelling question. I think it's the one that if I were to have a beer with, with you all after the conference, <laughs> because, you know, we're going to the pub afterwards, right? Uh, the, um, that's the question I think I would spend a lot of time trying to flesh out and explain and understand. So um, that is um, the winning question for me. Um, again, if um, uh, I, I would just like to, to thank the organizers based in uh, Poland um, for organizing this uh, worldwide event. I think it was fantastic. And I have been, uh, I've been, you know, delighted with, um, well, it's, it's, been, it's been fantastic presenting to you all. So thank you so much. But first, <laughs> I've just got one more announcement. And that is, uh, I think the, that is that there is a hackathon. If I go to rustydays.org and I look for a hackathon link. Sorry, my internet has decided that it wants to go very slowly. Um, here we are. The topic for this year's hackathon is emergent phenomena, or perhaps if you prefer, can you amaze us with simple rules? Let's create an amazing result with a simple rule set. If you've ever heard about cellular automata, fractals, or similar constructs, this is what we're kind of talking about. So uh, allow me to do one more plug, actually. If you would like to learn about writing a fractal in Rust, go to my YouTube channel. I have a video which is, describes <laughs> how to uh, generate the Mandelbrot set in Rust. And that can be possibly a good, and I've got some other generative art um, tutorials in there as well. And so um, in particular, this one um, is about uh, creating um, some generative art in Rust, and we kind of work through a tutorial. So I, uh, I would encourage you again, yeah, to look at my YouTube channel. So that is um, YouTube.com/slash/templex, and uh, great. I encourage you to participate in the hackathon. It's going to be fantastic, and um, and have a lovely week. Oh, a lovely weekend and a lovely evening, and I'll see you at the pub <laughs> because it's the last talk of the conference, right? I'll see everyone later. Take care.